Grace and peace. Ooh. Grace and peace in Jesus. So, how's your prayer life? Now, if I were to ask people, uh, and this is hypothetical, okay, bear with me. If I were to ask people if they think their prayer life needs some work, and I ask you to raise your hand if that applies to you, I think a lot of hands go up. I think most hands go up. Now, I'm not, not asking you to do that. I'm not into public confession that way. But I know this is a big concern among Christians. I should pray more. I should pray better. I should pray more broadly. I wish I knew how to pray better. You know, and this, this, this need to, or desire to grow in a prayer, it's, it's, not, it's not about lack of resources or studies or whatever. You know, this past week for the fun of it, I, I thought I'd, I'd do a little, little Amazon search and look for some books on prayer. I did a little search for prayer. I've got a number of books on prayer in my office, some good ones. Well, let's, let's, see, let's see what's out there. Well, I did not go through all those that came up because there were 90,000 of them. Um, I can't, I mean, literally, there were, it said over 90,000. <clears> and I can't help but see <laughs> that as indicator that there is definitely a market for improving our prayer lives. We feel this. We know this. Well, this is what we're going to focus on during our Lent midweek series. As you see, oh, <coughs> excuse me, of all the, the spiritual discipline, the spiritual practices that we might want to focus on in seeking to grow spiritually, spiritual growth and renewal, prayer, if it's not at the top of the list, it's, it's, it's up there. The practice of prayer. So it makes sense in this season of spiritual renewal and focus that we, we focus on prayer. But we're not going to be doing that, making use of any of those 90,000 books. Instead, we're going to focus on what Jesus said about prayer in one little section of the Sermon on the Mount. He had just been talking about prayer. We heard, I just read it, and just made that, that comment about, about don't, don't be like the pagans who, who, who think that they're kind of like, like earning or conjuring up an answer to prayer by the quality of their prayers, the effort they put into it, or how long their prayers are. But don't be like that. Prayer's not like that. This is how you should pray. That's what he said. This then is how you should pray. And what he said then is what we call the Lord's Prayer. Now, now we often use it as a set prayer, as a prayer. And we will later in this, this service, a prayer to say, every time we gather for worship here at St. John's, sometime, somewhere, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And that includes chapel service on Wednesdays. We pray the Lord's Prayer. And you may use it in your personal prayer life. I do quite a bit. Nothing wrong with that at all. But it still it could be a problem. A problem within. Because you see, we may use it so frequently, become so familiar, that we develop this capacity to be able to pray the Lord's Prayer without thinking about it at all. In fact, if you're really good at it, you can pray the Lord's Prayer and be thinking about something else. Or did I say good at it? I meant bad at it. Because that's not praying at all, is it? The problem isn't the prayer. The problem is not taking the time to think, what, are, what, what am I actually praying? So that's why it's seeing the Lord's Prayer not just as a prayer to pray, but as a pattern for prayer it can be very helpful. Because what it is, essentially, is a list of things to pray for. 
Jesus is saying, hey, when you pray, these are the things to pray for. This list right here, I'm going to give it to you. And we can pray for these things in our own words. We don't have to use the words that we're familiar with in the Lord's Prayer, including some of the archaisms like art, trespass. But the point is to pray, to engage our minds and our hearts and our wills as we come to the Father with our needs. So what do we pray for? What does the Lord say, this then is how you should pray? Well, the prayer that he gave, this pattern of a prayer, is structured pretty simply. There's an introduction, our Father who art in heaven, and then there is a list of seven petitions, seven things to pray for. And then this list of seven petitions can be divided into two groups. There's three that focus on God, praying regarding God's name, kingdom, and will. And then there's four that concern us in our lives, about our daily bread, about forgiveness, about guidance, and about protection. Pretty simple. This Lent, we're going to walk through these petitions on our Wednesday night. We're going to be unpacking the words. We're going to be applying them in our lives. And so, by God's grace, seek to more rightly make use of this wonderful gift that the Lord has given us. Now, you may very likely have been through a study or a series on the Lord's Prayer before. And I'm not promising anything novel or new in what we focus on. But you know, sometimes with something that is so familiar, what we really just need is to slow down and to think about it, to meditate on it a little bit, meditate on what we're saying, what we're doing. I've, I have found that personally helpful in my prayer life with the Lord's Prayer. And I tell you what, as I've gotten older with more of the road behind me and had God walking beside me through all kinds of stuff, learned more theology, the more I have come to, to treasure the beauty, simplicity, wisdom, and depth of this prayer, this pattern of prayer. So let's look at it. Tonight, we're going to look at two parts, the introduction and the first petition. Starts off this way, our Father who art in heaven. Jesus was calling his disciples to pray in a way that was unfamiliar to them, that they weren't used to. Calling God, the Lord, their Father in an unfamiliar way. In a familiar way, I'm sorry. Jesus did this frequently. He talked about doing the Father's will, being sent by the Father, about seeking to glorify the Father and everything that he did. And now he's inviting his disciples to address God in the same way. Now, this is how Luther put it in the catechism. Let's put it up there on, on the screen. And I, I didn't put this in the order of service before. I probably should have. So let's say it together now. Let's all read that together. This is Luther's explanation about addressing God as Father. Let's say it. With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. I can't really improve on that as an explanation, but I'll explain further anyhow. Think of God as the perfect father. Now, None of our earthly fathers are perfect, are perfect. And those of us who are fathers, we know our own imperfections. And our children and spouses know them even better. Here, though, we have a perfectly good 
and loving father. And for those of you whose earthly fathers were way worse than imperfect, here's the father you long for, who calls us to call him dad, to come close, and to bring him our name. A father who perfectly provides, perfectly loves, perfectly corrects and disciplines, and perfectly forgives. All that is contained in the word father. So why can we do this? Why can we call him father? Because he has sent his son to be our savior and to make us his children. And this the Son of God did by living the perfect life we cannot live and dying the death that we deserved. And now through faith in him, we are adopted into the family of the triune God. Think about that. Adopted into the family of the triune God. So now we call Jesus our brother, and we call God the Father our father. This is, this is a gift of grace. The gift of prayer is a gift of grace, just as everything about prayer is a gift of grace. The answers, whether we see them or not to our prayers, are gifts of grace. We never, nor can we ever, be worthy of God hearing our prayers, let alone answering them. But he does so out of fatherly goodness and kindness for the sake of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. All of that is included in this invitation by Jesus to us to approach the Father with these words, Father, Father. To pray that way, not just king, master, ruler, judge, Father. And not just my father, he says, our father. Now, Jesus doesn't mean to imply that you can only pray this prayer in a group. You can only pray in a group. Now, those gospels have numerous examples of Jesus going off by himself to pray. But by calling us to pray our father, we're being reminded that because by grace, we've all been claimed by him and we all claim him as our father, then we are family, brothers and sisters. And one of the things we do as a family is we pray together with each other, for each other, our father. And then by saying our father who art in heaven, we're being reminded that the God to whom we're praying is the holy God over all things. And this God of the universe, who loves us as a father, is able to answer our prayers. And so to him we pray. That, our father, who art great, great. Okay. Hallowed be thy name. Now, this is the first, the first petition, and the first thing that Jesus would have us pray for, pray about when we come to him in prayer, has to do with lifting up the holiness of the name of God. It's about God's reputation, about his honor, about his righteousness, that it be recognized, celebrated, pointed to. Now, in that explanation that Luther wrote that we read together earlier about the first petition, he points out that God's name is, is holy in itself. It is intrinsically holy. It cannot be unholy. We cannot make the name of God holier, just as we can't make God more perfect. God's name is holy in and of itself. But what we're praying about is that God, the name of God be shown to be holy in our lives, by our lives, so that we regard it as holy in all that we do. 
mindful of the holiness of our holy God. So we then pray that this happen. Now, this is a really good place to start in prayer. And a good place to start in Lent because praying about God's holiness being shown in our lives, it covers all of our lives. You see, the name of God has been placed upon us. In baptism, the name of God is applied to you. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He claims us as his own, as a gift of grace. He puts his name on us, tags us, marks us as his possession. So we then have the opportunity to live out of that identity. I belong to the holy God. And now I'm going to show it by what I say, by what I do, by how I live. And when the character of our lives matches the character of the one whose name has been put upon us, then God's name is shown to be holy among us. And when we fail to do so, it's called sin, for which we repent, symbolized today by the ashes. So when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we're praying that God's name be hallowed in us and through us. In fact, sometimes I, I, when I'm slow down and praying the Lord's Prayer, these first three petitions about name, kingdom, and, and will, I, I, I can pray through a bunch of prepositions. Hallowed be thy name in me. Hallowed be thy name to me. Hallowed be thy name through me. Hallowed be thy name for me. You think about it. In the name of God in my life. But we can also pray this petition not just about ourselves, but the world around us. Hallowed be thy name. Holy be thy name my church. Hallowed be thy name in my school, in my workplace, among my friends. Hallowed be thy name in our country, in our world. May the name of God be held up as holy, righteous, and honorable throughout the universe. Hallowed be thy name. All of that. We pray. So in your prayers this week, I would encourage you to focus on this petition, the holiness of the name of God. And then and, and start your own personal prayer time praying about this. You might want to pray the prepositions like I talked about, hallowed be thy name in me, to me, for me, through me. You are marked by the Lord. His name is upon you. He has claimed you. You are his. May his spirit so bless us in all that we say and do that our lives truly honor the holiness of his name. Amen.